I mean, everybody's pretty much exhausted, right? I mean, I am. Um, hello. I wanted to thank um, Sonic X. It's really fantastic to be back. Um, has been uh, long. Thank you, Lucas, Annette, certainly, and everybody. Um, you know, one of, I mean, Sonic X is like, I just want to, put in some, some praise here because it's really a unique uh, place uh, for me and I've seen a lot of places and festivals and there's something just uh, exceptionally inspiring about Sonic Act, so I'm, I'm thrilled. Um, thanks to the State League as well. Um, I like to be part of Te Chioji Imchishan. That's a joke. Um, is a kind of, I mean, the whole thing, right? I mean, the whole Anthropocene um, kind of thing um, is sort of also an, an acknowledgement. I think in some, some, you know, there was some talk about this, that it's, it's probably too late already, and so we are sort of managing the decline. Um, I was, I really want to talk about this very briefly because I was obsessed in the last years with the uh, zombie apocalypse. So I was um, for way too long looking at anything, viral outbreak, um, you know, end of electricity, zombie apocalypse, which kind of encapsulates all of these sub really, like the end of civilization as we know it, the breakdown, and then a return to a more primal, direct, you know, kind of uh, primitive sort of lifestyle, right? I always think when I look at these uh, things, I think under no circumstances I would like to be caught in the zombie apocalypse because I don't own weapons and all these kind of things. I'm, I'm, I'm painfully unprepared. Um, and living in the United States, I feel I would be just surrounded by all the wrong people with a gazillion of guns and all the right things in such a moment. I don't know where this exactly leads to, but the, the zombie apocalypse speaks, you know, like philosophically, philosophically kind of looking into this for a moment, I mean, speaks of a certain unease, right? Of an unease about the fragility of an extremely uh, complex system that we built um, called civilization that is um, kind of by all means and, and by any data that we, that we have access to at the moment, like unsustainable. I mean, there's a famous graphs, right, in terms of um, population growth and water uh, um, consumption and energy consumption. I mean, name it, food consumption, and none of it is sustainable. So we keep going anyway. And I'm not a pessimist, but I perfectly think it's really sort of gone. I mean, this is like, I don't think this can meaningfully return because it would require like so much conscious, mature, and together, you know, as a collective, as a global collective, together kind of action. And I don't really see that, certainly not in the United States, um, and, and really in the end, nowhere. Um, there's this element of, of, you know, greed and like capitalism doesn't help, et cetera, et cetera. So I was thinking though, um, and that's the last thing I wanna say before, like I think really showing work are mostly showing work because the exhaustion. Um, I was thinking about in my lifetime, or since I come, can, can remember, and starting, you know, when I, when I talked to my grandmother, right, Cecilia Kitzler, who was born in 1906 and there was like nothing. I mean, because in the end we're talking about the acceleration, still in the amplification, and the whatever Anthropocene is a thing of the last for me, it's of the last hundred years, and then, you know, it's sort of, it's got a totally lifting off. Um, and, but this is just what happens in her lifetime. These things got introduced eventually, obviously, and she told me about what a big thing there was when the first car came into her village, um, and so forth, um, and, how's this work? I haven't done this in a while. All right, I'm gonna just click on it then. 
Oh, yeah. So my mother told me this story about, also very interesting, about her first like home radio, right? That was um, powered by batteries and they had, she had to walk to a hydro dam to get it kind of loaded. And that was the only sort of gadget or the only gear, kind of an early promise of connectivity, right? One channel, one way. Of course, now we're like, like, like we are sort of thinking today. Um, obviously, in my life, then everything happens very quickly. And, you know, there was TV when I was eight in 68 or something. I flew for the first time in, in 76. I got my computer when it was 28 already. Um, cell phone, blah, blah, email. So um, things, things have changed very, very rapidly. And all of this is, a, is about, for me, about acceleration, um, aggregation, and, and uh, uh, for lack of a better word, like a, a humongous amount of, of ambition to grow and, and, and to become omnipotent and, I don't know. Anywho, I'm gonna not go into anything, this clock and time thing that I had prepared, but this is I wanna show because I, I found it like really interesting um, just to show also like the short period of time since we, we, we you know, we have accustomed ourselves to like the, the, the so-called white city of the Colombian exposition in Chicago. And that's for me interesting because I had no idea about it before I moved there. Um, it was the first, I mean, they built this, like a first model of this explosive, you know, and, and machine driven, um, uh, construction machine driven also um, boom of, building big things, big, like whole city or city parts in like two years then. It was a swamp area. And then Frederick uh, Law Olmsted, the famous uh, landscape designer came in and just, um, you know, built one of his phenomenally uh, interesting uh, landscape parks, really. And um, who was the, um, wait, where's my, I don't see my notes. Anyway, there was an architect, obviously. Who was the architect? Sullivan? No, I guess so. Uh, Sullivan, right? And that was the first place, and this, the interesting part is that this was the first electrified city. There's the story when, the, when it was opened, and by the way, it was called the White City, because they had to build it so quickly. It was all neoclassicist, you know, crap architecture. Um, but um, they had to paint it. And there was only one color that was available in this enormous amount of you know, tons they needed was white. And the other one was they had to find a way to paint quickly, so they invented spray paint. It's the first spray paint painted um, and very quickly painted thing. So all the buildings were white. The whole thing was like almost like an artwork, like a meta sort of installation kind of artwork from today's perspective. And then they turned on the, the, the light at the opening, it was dark, and this like thousands and like, actually a hundred thousand, I think, um, uh, incandescent bulbs went on and created this enormous flood of, of light and it was, everybody was gasping, right? So that is about 110 years ago, not too long, really. Okay, having said that, so, I, my work is like, since a, a quite a long time, um, informed by technology one way or the other, media technology. I um, was pointed in a way really uh, early on. I mean, I went to the, um, I started as an architect, and then I, I went to the, I switched to the Academy of Applied Arts in Vienna, I think in 82, uh, because I was very fascinated with uh, uh, Peter Weibel, um, the professor, then a young professor, sort of punkish, uh, who now uh, still runs the ZKM. And, uh, you know, he, he, I remember like he came into class and he said, okay, anybody's seen Tron, right? And everybody said, what? And so we all went to see Tron and he also brought in like early Commodore com computers, uh, home computers, which I was perfectly uninterested in. But a couple of years later with a, a Amiga 500, I think it really hit me. And so that there was this like enormous promise and potential of um, you know, the digital whatever revolution. So I, I got into that. Um, what you see here is a, 
uh, piece called Noise Gate uh, from my period with granular synthesis, a collaboration with Ulf Langheinrich that lasted from about uh, 92 to 2003. Uh, we did a lot of performances and all mediated, you know, without the performer and the flesh and us more like operators behind the, the, the audience. Um, large scale immersive performances that, that sort of created, that wanted to create, and, and this is where the whole nature topic comes in, they wanted to create a kind of a, um, you know, a second, like, well, an artificial sort of nature on the in, in the inside, like simulation, simulated spaces, simulated physical spaces. Mm, this was very interesting, uh, the, the picture, and that's why I, I wanted to show it. It's from a, a never used subway station in Hanover. The uh, Kunstverein Hanover uh, showed the piece, and uh, we were looking for um, um, an interesting enigmatic space. And uh, when they rebuilt the train station in Hanover, they thought they would build a uh, you know, new subway line, which then they never built. So dormant, nobody, inaccessible to anybody, lies this temple, this concrete temple of like vast proportion must have cost a fortune, just sits there for no good reason, which is also like one of the things that we just do, right? We build a lot of things we don't need, we, we produce a lot of stuff we don't need. I mean, it's like, um, I don't know, it's like this, this, this whole idea of consumerism, I think we haven't quite um, even d discussed because in essence, we're also bored to death anyway, so this is part of this, but it's a longer discussion. Um, Anywho, uh, time to show something. Uh, for a long time, with, with Ulf, it was all about the way that uh, technology affected or would affect our, uh, not just perception, but being, our habits, our, the way we, we move was about the, um, we talked a lot, I remember, about uh, cyborgs, right? Machine, machine people. So let's see if this works. Or not? So very 90s. 
Um, it's actually the part after is is um, but we don't have time. Second part is actually it's, uh, more interesting. Anyway, um, I'm just rushing through this. Um, so after that, after uh, granular synthesis, when when Olaf and I went back to being like uh, both solo artists again. Um, sure. Oh, cool. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Um, I started working uh, with uh, 3D uh, real-time uh, simulation systems based on um, uh, game engine technology. And one of the reasons that I, initially I just wanted to have something that was more uh, intuitive in real-time that I could compose with on the fly rather than, you know, doing um, editing, rendering, and all these, these sort of steps that, that a, a more complex production needs. Of course, it turns out like that was way more complex, but uh, I did these, I, I wanted to show this, uh, particularly for this, um, the, the karma installation, there was a, a cave piece for the, for the cave at Oz Electronica in Linz, which was such a physically abhorrent space. It's just very, um, it's tiny. And it's ugly, and it's it's sort of really not attractive, and until you switch on all this like uh, expensive technology, and all of us and put on this head uh, display goggles, and all of a sudden it, it really comes to life and becomes interesting. And I remember thinking then, and this is still something I, I keep thinking, that while we while we obsessively right build this virtual end or this parallel plant, which is not a parallel plant any longer because it is perfectly part of what we do and integrate it and, and it's really one world now. So that process is kind of, is gone also. But while we are ever more going into the simulation techniques and, and virtual immersive spaces, um, the, as, a, as a side effect almost, the actual planet of what I like to call original nature, um, uh, more and more, you know, goes away in both in prominence um, yeah, or presence, but also in terms of health, if you will, and uh, togetherness. So we, it's almost like it's a weird transition from, from the, both from the outside living, this is like also part of civilization, from the, you know, unshielded, exposed outside to the ever more shielded and ever more um, constructed like inside that's kind of simulates outside with these kind of things. I find in that regard, by the way, I find, I eternally um, find interesting the, this, uh, the book on the civilizing process by Novo Elias, who um, pretty much tracks the, the habitual changes of society in, um, in Central Europe, uh, I think, um, mostly using uh, Latin, Eng Old English, Old French, and Old German texts to show how we, how the way we live together and the way we, um, our needs as individuals, how that changes uh, since the Middle Ages. And, and one of the, the aspects that fascinates me the most in that regard is that it pretty much tracks how we, while we actually grow in population, how we, we need ever more space individually to feel comfortable. Um, like, you know, like in the, the old, very old days, in the Middle Ages, you would be, the whole family would live in like one room, sleep in one bed, even when strangers or, or visitors would come, they would sleep in the bed with everybody. Um, and the animals would be all around the bed for reasons of, of warmth and, and security and etc. cetera. Um, and nowadays, I mean, if you don't have your own room, right? it's like kind of op oppressive. Um, most people at least feel like that. And I remember when I came to New York in the early uh, years in New York, I was really, I was very fascinated by the, the advertisements, the real estate advertisements in the New York Times that had like floor plans. And the floor plans in the, for, for wealthy uh, people in, in bigger apartments. And it, and it showed like a floor plan pretty much resembled like, you know, a series of individual apartments like gathered in a kind of a meta apartment or like a, um, it's a cluster of mini apartments forming like a bigger apartment. So each child and, and everybody in the household 
has their own room, their own bathroom, their own walk-in closet. It's a complete, unique, discrete sort of unit. So there's like this imbalance, right? We grow, we, be, we become bigger, but we, we need more space, we need more um, of everything. It's a, it's a weird um, kind of logic in that. Anywho. Okay. Um, I started working um, in about 2004 and five, I started um, finally following up on an idea um, about a truly immersive physical space that had sort of traits of, na of natural uh, landscapes, but extremely amplified and exaggerated, mostly using fog and, and stroboscopic light and um, pulse lighting, which um, was initially a performance feat and then later on Z, and I'm gonna show a very quick, because you cannot really document the effect. In essence, you are in, uh, you're in inner space, you see nothing, you don't see the hand in front of your uh, uh, face, and so you are kind of, the space collapses onto you, and you are really quite isolated. Um, but at the same time, particularly the stroboscopic frequencies create this like kaleidoscopic 2D, 3D infinity effect that seem to emerge from within you and, and perfectly transcend the boundary between you know, the, in, the inside of us and the outside. Um, it's like a bathing in, 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 in pure light of sorts. So in, when he was in New York, we, we did a documentation just of audience feedback to that. It's really hard to say something smart about something that's sort of like purely sensual. Um, that was the most insane thing I've ever been a part of. At first, it was extremely uncomfortable. I really wanted out. The anxiety was... Almost scary. He opens the first door and it's just like boom. Like once your visibility starts going, you're kind of like, okay, whoa, what's what's happening? You don't even know where you are. You lose your sense of space, time, and motion. I mean, I didn't even know I was in there for 20 minutes. I would have guessed like two minutes. It did feel a little bit like death. You know, like if you don't have a body, is this what your existence is like? If you went to heaven, like it felt like you would be like entering heaven. I've never, I've never felt like that ever. Forms are appearing in front of you. Fractals and, and B-waves that just moved around in a clockwise direction and a counterclockwise direction. Different patterns emerging that cross fade into each other that spread out. And the shapes were so beautiful. So beautiful. And the colors. The colors melting into each other. Patterns just swirling around each other. Things flying through the air. And Faces and like pieces of wood and stuff that like I knew wasn't there. <laughs> Electric crackling around me like lightning sort of but on a tiny scale. You don't know if you're focusing on something 10 feet away or if it's right here. I was always staring in front for some reason and then at some point I turned around and it was the same thing. You're sort of like, oh, I'm on another planet. I wasn't sure if things were happening inside my head or... Or is it in front of me? Is it I, my eyes that's doing this? At some point you just stop and take it in what you're, yeah. why it's happening because you cannot really rationalize, you cannot put a narrative, you cannot do it, you just have to take what, whatever you're saying. And it's not just uh, kind of a loss of consciousness, a loss of boundary, but it's also uh, very consciously produced, right? So it's aesthetic, so it's paying attention to different patterns. So it was, it was really exciting. I want to do it again. I'd like to do it again. Do it again. I'd love to do it again. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would definitely do it again. <laughs> Okay, so after like a quite really long period of time, like spending, um, I mean, I grew up, I didn't mention that, I grew up like halfway in the, in the countryside and halfway in a small city, uh, Linz, which is about 200,000 uh, inhabitants. And then um, I think with 18, I moved to Vienna. And since then, pretty much one way or the other, I, I live in, in cities. And I think that's also like really an imp important factor and the so-called uh, Anthropocene, or like in, in the, the world we're living today, that the majority of people already lives in cities, and I think in another 20 years, it's gonna be 75% of all world population 
will live in a city. So we have gone equally so, I think, within pretty much 100 years from, you know, a majority of people living in, in, in more like in an open, natural, landscape-y, uh, nature landscape area to um, cityscapes, right? And then cityscapes become like what, when, you're, when you grow up and you're born in a city, um, that's like what, what really nature is or, or new nature is. My wife has never slept um, in the outdoors and for her the idea to sleep in a, without a, a shelter is absolutely abhorrent or like shocking. Um, so that's gonna do, you know, that defines a certain kind uh, of mindset and I think it's, it's also like a preliminary step in, in, in being not that upset about things going away that you don't even know about, that you've never really been intrinsically or, or you know, in a kind of way emotionally involved with. Um, so in, in instead, anyway, and this is like another thing that happens, in, you know, you can see this on all TV channels, like at the same time, we have all these, these very talented, this extremely um, well-outfitted and patient documentarian uh, teams for discovery channels um, and, and pretty much for all the, the, the nature um, TV outlets that record like the wonders of the world, like the best of that there is, right? In sort of in an acknowledgement that, you know, species and landscapes and, and uninterrupted landscapes, at least all of this will, will go away in, in, in sort of short time. So that sort of, anyway, I, I got this urge about five years ago to, to revisit uh, open landscapes and, and leave the city and the airports and all of that. And um, I, of course, and this is prototypical, I, I defined it as a, as, a, as a project, right, as a, as a work project, uh, as much as a meditation on the idea of nature. So, what I found really, and, and what is in all these works that I have done since, and this is one of them, Sector 2C, like an, an early example. It, um, it's really about constructed reality, um, which is obviously media reality, so it's uh, about editing, animating, you know, layering, transforming, um, and certainly se selecting. It's a very selective form of perception. Um, the work that I'm showing here at Sonic Acts is the latest in the series. It's called Measure. Um, I think for obvious, if not too literal reasons. And it's a series of tableaus, really. I, I mean, I'm not going to... I'm going to show a, a quick excerpt, but generally it's in the... It's in the state leaks, so if you have time, uh, go see it. 17 minutes long, and it's, it's kind of, I call it like sometimes my attention deficit disorder piece. It's, it, it sort of go, keeps going, you know, from one supposed spot to the next, never really going anywhere. Um, and it's, it's all about the construction, right? The, the, um, and mannerism. I mean, I, I um, okay, I have to put this away. So I'm, I, I checked, um, I remembered mannerism. And um, like, I think Wikipedia says, has like three, um, you know, points to mannerism. Uh, one, a distinctive behavioral, tr behavioral trait, especially one that calls attention to itself and idiosyncrasy. Two, exaggerated of affected style in art, and three, an artistic style of the late 1500s, characterized by distortion of elements such as scale and perspective. So this is a manieristic uh, sort of project. And uh, let's just go to the excerpt. Thank you. 
Anyway, I think we don't have any time. Um, so yeah, one, one last thing very, very briefly. I, I feel like everybody wants to go. But um, I'm working on a project right now, and this goes somewhat with what Lucas, I think, showed before, um, at least the, the, the drone piece. Um, I mean, I had the, I don't know whether the pleasure, but the, the privilege, certainly, to be in the Emirates last year, three, three times, incidentally. And the last time I was on, on a two-week shoot there, because the, the Emirates and some of the, the Mideast, like including you know, all this, this explosively growing, uh, rapidly growing areas, um, also in Asia, China certainly, um, they so epitomize for me kind of the, just the, the scale, the, pro, the proportion, the, 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 the potency of what's, what's possible now just by means of contemporary technology in, in terms of just rendering you know, not just like buildings, but, but completely re whatever literal and more naive, um, like reshaping um, uh, landscapes, right? Um, I mean, this is the, like in Dubai, and this is for me, this is really interesting. It's kind of like Las Vegas on steroids. Um, it, everything pretty much is not, nothing is older than 50 years, and most everything that we now think of when we think of Dubai is like not older than like 15 or at the most 20 years old. It's, it's kind of a lab city. It's a, it's, it's a city that's been, that's been like, the building is the wrong word. It's just being painted in a, in a strange way. Um, it, it is a perfectly, you know, there shouldn't be anything. There's also like this whole hubris, right? To build in a place where you have no reason to really I don't know, B, there's like no water. So of course, all the water in Dubai comes from desalination, desalination plants. It's about the most energy intensive way of creating sweet water. And then you would think that, of course, there's all solar panels, right? But there are practically no solar panels. And it was interesting because a former student of mine um, off the Art Institute um, actually was um, growing up there as a Chinese Dubaian, of course, will probably never be citizen. There's 15% uh, native Arab population and 85% um, from all over the world, like guest laborers who have you know, temporary uh, visas and um, allowances to stay, but otherwise no entitlement. Um, I think you can be, uh, apply for citizenship over 20 years if you never have left for more than like two days or something. So it's, it's really wild. I mean, so in, in, it's the biggest Indian population outside of the subcontinent. Um, anyways, it's, it's a sci-fi city. And I always thought of it that it's, um, in some of the styles and the, the sensibility is really Star Wars. Um, it's very, very 20th century um, and certainly technology. And so I asked Lee actually why they wouldn't use you know, solar because it's all new. Why don't you just go with the, you know, what's possible? And he said, well, no, that when they started, the, the, there was no solar in bulk, and it wasn't just quite there yet. So they built anyway what they could build very quickly, and because it had to happen immediately, right? It's like, must have it now. And then if time comes, they will just rebuild it, and then everything will be solar, period, right? So you have, in, in essence, this kind of desert landscape that doesn't even, and this is a thing that I learned only last year after my last visit, that doesn't even have the freaking right sand for the needed concrete, right? So the sand that you would think is there in gazillions is incompetent. So what happens? All the non-touristically um, you know, developed beaches in Southeast Asia are being stripped of sand at the moment by like workers who earn, of course, nothing because that's the right sand. So all the sand goes from beaches into ships to China, Dubai, to build there, you know, the new, the new glory of um, kind of things. I mean, it's sort of, anyway, it's sort of really sh striking. Um, I went there and like, you know, I, I did this flyovers uh, on, on Google Earth. And I mean, this for instance is really interesting. Um, you have the, and I think they must design this actually with satellite imagery. Otherwise, you, 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 you never get to that, right? So um, 
but that was before the crisis had collapsed. And these little buildings that you see there um, still sit there all by themselves. We, uh, we went there and eventually to be redeveloped again. The other thing that struck me, and I think this is important, I mean, you, you, you think when you drive through the desert, and it's the same in the American Midwest, it is like open public space, right? But in Dubai anyway, there's nothing public, it's all private, everything. There's like a, a, an iota of, of public accessible spaces. Um, in the American Midwest, I mean West, like, like here there's just like uh, Salt Lake City, you have um, some parks, but mostly it's like either military, which is not really public at all, or like, you know, uh, industry that is by definition always toxic. Uh, nuclear dump, whatever, waste dumps, incineration without filters and so forth. This is, a, I was there last year also, I'm the, this one of the biggest copper mines uh, that sits right next to um, Salt Lake City is sort of uh, humongous. Um, anyway, I'm rushing. This is, um, it looks still like really beautiful, you know, one way or the other. It's this enormously so-called sublime landscapes, but um, they are completely defined, they're completely mapped, they're completely owned, and even if it's a natural park, right, of, uh, um, we are proud of that, but even that, just to call it a park is already like indicates that we are in control, we define, we are generous, you know, let's say, hey, nature, you know, you can, in this area, for the time being, you can sort of be on your own and like do what you like. So that's actually what happens. It's gonna go actually on, there's a project for 16, on a, a beautiful building by Oscar Niemeyer, Level Khan, um, it's a theater. Okay. That's it.